what is the clearest understanding of the appropriate use of force to defend oneself or family that harmonizes scenarios from the Old Testament up through the early church and how it relates to or differs from the threat of harm for simply being Christian? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know of any command that makes self-defense a sin, uh, even self-defense uh, by the use of force a sin. I mean, people probably would think of the turn the other cheek passage. But, you know, the, the, the context for that is largely, again, self-preservation. And I, I think, you, you know, you can, you can take that choice. But what I'm trying to say is that any kind of self-defense doesn't have to be a, a sort of first resort. And so I, I, I look at the, the turn the other cheek command as, as, as leaving the door open to not defending yourself at all. Or at, at the very least, not having it be sort of a reflex, you know, first response, you know, kind of thing. But when it pertains to other people, uh, the, the the text doesn't say turn everybody else's cheek, you know, especially, you know, if if it's someone, you know, in your family, someone that you, you have, you know, there, there's 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 the, the whole biblical principle of when it's in your power to do good for someone, you ought to do it. You know, from the book of James, you know, that I would suggest that saving somebody's life is probably a good thing to do for them. And you know, if that requires the use of force, then I don't see anything that forbids that. So that I don't, I don't see the turn the other cheek thing as sort of this cut and dried, no, no nuancing possible sort of statement. I think there is some nuancing there. You know, I don't know of any principle that says you know Christians must be willing to be uh, abused in, in at all times, places, and manners. Uh, as well, what what I what I think the point of the command is that that you're not combative, you're not the aggressor, you know, you're not. Um, this isn't a first response, you know, kind of thing. You're not looking for a fight, you know, that sort of thing. It, it I mean, what Jesus did say, and I think this this command largely gets un- misunderstood. You know, I've not come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword, or you know, I've, and he he tells them the disciples at one point to go out and you know take a sword with them. But th- those are not offensive weapon. Um, sort of endorsements. In other words, Jesus isn't saying, well, I'm here to pick a fight, you know, and I, and, I'm, and I want you guys to go out and pick fights as well. The whole idea behind those things is that Jesus knew that when he came and when he started preaching who he was, and he, he knew where it was going to lead, he knew it would result in, you know, upheaval and persecution. He knew the early church was, was going to be targeted. And so he actually advocates uh, in, in those examples having something with you to defend yourself. But what, what I don't want to see is I don't want to see statements like that uh, taken out of context as as far as, oh, oh now we get, to, this is our first response. You know, somebody comes after us because we're Christians, we're going to go beat the crap out of them. You know, that, that isn't the point at all. It, it's a very defensive posture. It's not the first response. Again, but, and, and these things do have a context. And I, and, and I, I don't think that, that the point of them is either be the aggressor or you know, be the doormat, you know, uh, unto death. I mean, if it's just you, I mean, you, you know, you, you can make that decision. I, I don't think you're committing suicide, you know, necessarily or something like that. But I certainly think there's, there is good reason to believe, again, from the Gospels and some of the, the, the statements, you know, I've just alluded to, that you are allowed to defend yourself. I mean, you, you think back into the Old Testament, I mean, God, there, there are plenty of examples where God expected his people to defend themselves, you know, against their enemies, you know, when they were threatened with attack or serious bodily harm or death. I mean, you're, like you're not forbidden from building fences. You're not forbidden from having standing armies. You're not forbidden. I mean, you even have the Avenger of Blood kind of thing, which is a, which is a little bit different. But again, it, it's, it's, it's this notion that God isn't repulsed by using physical force for some appropriate purpose. So the idea of physical force itself is not re- repugnant uh, to God. So I think the point of a lot of this language is, again, it, it can't be used to support aggression or, again, a first response kind of reaction, uh, as opposed to defending yourself as kind of a last resort or, again, to protect others. I think another problem is that Christians somehow think the use of force might be okay uh, for less than severe bodily threat. Again, when, when I think of use, for, use of force, and I would, when I see it discussed in Scripture, it, it's not just a defense against, oh, my city government made another regulation and I don't like it. So I'm going to go down there and, you know, again, beat the tar out of somebody, or I'm going to threaten their, their family, you know, and say, you can't do that. This is a terrible law. This is persecuting, you know, my church. So I'm going to, I'm going to go threaten you with bodily harm. I mean, that this, this is absurd, but I mention it because we, we do have some of this thinking in the church. 
you know, that the, the church has somehow been conflated with the Sons of Liberty or something, uh, you know, in the revolutionary period, you know, that the, the we're, the we're being oppressed by the king, so let's go, you know, burn somebody somebody's house down or destroy their property or something like that. Again, the, these are absurd conflations, and, and I, I do see them in places uh, in the church. We have to see them for what they are. They're, they're, they're conflating two different things. They're combining two different things that— um, shouldn't be combined. So I think we have to guard against that. Um, what, what I'm talking about, what I think of the intent of the question is, is this situation where you have se- severe bodily harm, perhaps, you know, threat of death, you know, kind of thing. Can you defend yourself? And I think, yeah, you, you can certainly defend your, yourself. I mean, this whole idea about authority, you know, Romans 13, we're quick to quote that. But Romans 13, of course, presupposes that the government is doing good things. It's, you know, punishing the wicked and rewarding the, uh, the, the person who's, who's obedient, we often aren't in those situations. And I, I'm not going to say that I, I'm not going to contradict Paul and say those powers that, that be are, are, aren't really ordained by God. I think they are ordained by God. No, no government authority. I mean, just let's go back and think about the book of Daniel, you know, because Daniel actually has these discussions when he's interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's degree, no, ne- excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. No governing authority gets to where it is unless God allows it. God sets up kings and he tears them down. So it's true that every governing authority is where it is because God has allowed that. But that doesn't mean that God endorses it. He doesn't mean he's happy with it. It doesn't even mean that it's not under wrath. Okay, in the Old Testament, yeah, God used Assyria. He used Babylon to punish his own people. But they were also under wrath. I mean, their their judgment was pending and it was going to be even worse um, than you know, what he was using them for. So I think, again, we need to contextualize Romans 13 a little bit. I mean, the apostles themselves said we ought to obey God rather than man. You know, you go back in the Old Testament, you have the Egyptian midwives. You know, they were blessed by God because they didn't kill the babies. You know, Daniel's friends, they didn't bow down, you know, to the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And and they were, you know, the Lord saved them when it, when you know, their, their own lives were in, in, in peril. Obadiah, he's sort of a, a forgotten figure, not, not the one that the, prof, the prophetic book's named after, but during the time of Elijah, Obadiah was the guy who hid the prophets of the Lord from under, you know, right under Ahab's nose. Okay? God rewarded him for that. These are all resistances to governing authority. And what I'm saying is they're not contradictory to Romans 13. I mean, the rule of thumb is when a governing authority mandates or tries to force you to sin against the higher authority, the highest authority, which would be God, you're under no obligation to obey that. I'm sorry, Lord, I had to go worship Baal because the king said so. That's not acceptable. Uh, you know, God isn't going to say, oh, well, I'll give you a pass for that one. You know, no, that, that's not acceptable. And so I, I do think in Scripture we have a principle that there is a time uh, when Christians are are not only allowed to resist you know, the, that sort of authority, but they're, they're sort of expected to resist that, that authority. And you might be in a context where you can defend yourself. A lot of these contexts, of course, you can't. And, and you should be willing, again, to suffer if you're suffering for the right things, as, as you know, Peter so often said in his writings, uh, because Jesus suffered. But you may also run into contexts where you can protect yourself. And again, I see glimpses of this in, in the Gospels where Jesus warns his followers that this is what it's going to come to. So take a sword with you, you know, be able to, to defend yourself, to fight off your enemies. You know, he didn't just go out and say, you know, when somebody comes out with, at you with a sword, just lay down there and say, where do you, you know, stab me somewhere, make it quick, you know, that kind of thing. We don't, we don't see that. What we never see, the use of a sword or, again, the use of, of, of force as a first response or in, in an aggressive mode where something, you know, less than you know, life and limb is at stake. So I I think you can look at scriptural examples and put together, you know, a a picture of, of, you know, how we, how it's appropriate to respond in in certain situations. You know, we can sit here and theorize and do the, do the philosophizing about how it's best to stay out of harm's way. And I'm sure that's good, but you're not always going to be able to, to do that. So, you know, I, I used to tell my kids, you know, and they're older now, I mean, they're, they're basically grown, but I would still tell them, look, I want you to know that, if there's a guy coming through the room or through through the window into your room and you start yelling and dad comes into the room and he's trying to get you, I want you to know that dad will kill that guy before he lets him take you. <laughs> I want you to know that your life is more important than that guy's life. 
you know, that I, that I won't, I won't stop and say, well, you know, I, boy, I could, I could probably protect my daughter here if I killed this guy, but other, I can't, I can't figure out a way to do it. Oh, well, you know, it's just too bad. It's just too bad. You know, I wish I could have found a, a less violent way to protect my kids. I'm not, you know, I wanted my kids to, to know that dad was their defender and he would do whatever it took. And again, I, I think we're, we're obligated you know, to do that in extreme circumstances, because it's in the, if it's in the, 